Um, a selective perfusion using a parallel circuit. Uh, there's some documentation of this in two, early 2000s, and we took on doing it and have done it for about 16 years now. Um, so in working on the great vessels, you really want to create a bloodless field for the surgeon. You want to be able to support circulatory rest, but you need to protect the brain. That's the hallmark of the challenge. Um, considerations is uh, where are you going to cannulate for these cases? How cold are you going to go? Um, what kind of brain protection you're going to use? And if you're going to use selective perfusion. So there's lots of places to cannulate. Um, femoral is kind of a tried and true, but we tend to go ahead and use the subclavian, the subclavian with a side graft, or the anominate. And we probably use the anominate more than the other two. So when it goes to how cold, a couple of years ago, 13, um, a group of anesthesiologists and uh, other surgeons got together and gave some parameters using nasal pharyngeal. So they said the profound was under 14, deep was 14 to 20, moderate was 20 to 28, and mild was 28 to 34. And so deep hypothermia, um, it adds time to an already long procedure. Um, cerebral regulation is impaired, coagulation is impaired, vasoconstriction occurs, and there's diminished organ perfusion. And then we have to deal with the brain. The brain is only 2% of the body weight. It uses 15% of the cardiac output. It takes 20% of the oxygen consumption. It uses 25% of the glucose. It stores no glucose. So we need to be able to give it constant flow. So with the hypothermia, when you, um, the whole idea is to, is to reduce the cerebral metabolic rate. And so if you go down to 18 degrees, you're gonna reduce it um, only to 39% in some people. So we found over the last few years that things, what we thought would occur in all, don't necessarily occur in everyone. And so um, I picked up some of the EKG um, no nomenclature in here just because in the last four years we've been starting to watch EKG also and found that EKG doesn't go silent in everyone it, as you get colder. And sometimes it takes a lot of cold to get it to go silent. Um, and so with the different degrees, um, when you get to 14 degrees, or under 15, you're only decreasing your brain metabolism by five more percent. So then that makes you wonder if you need to go profound. Maybe you can go with deep more often. Um, and then when you don't go deep and you use moderate, you get by with it if you have selective perfusion. So selective perfusion, where there's antigrade, there's retrograde. I'm going to kind of focus on the antigrade part because that's about what this circuit does is antigrade. But there's good support for antigrade and retrograde along with not going to profound hypothermia. Um, the, and there's various cannulation sites which I've already mentioned. So we usually head to the nominate or the subclavian. Um, main point on this picture is remember that we have this circle of Willis. Kind of, it becomes kind of important when you're doing cerebral perfusion. Um, so with selective perfusion, you're able to maintain perfusion to, to the brain. There's some talk that we wash out um, toxic metabolites with it. Um, it allows to keep the systemic circulation at a different temperature. There's um, quite a good demonstration that selective perfusion with um, less cooling works. We usually flow through the head around 15, 10 to 15 uh, milliliters per kilo per minute or somewhere around five to six hundred, occasionally a little more than that. Um, we usually go unilateral, but you can go bilateral um, if you need to um, because you have to keep in mind that some of those patients don't have a complete Willis. And the, the, the papers, the literature out there, some say 15 percent of the patients don't. There's a couple of papers that say as much as 47 percent of the patients don't have a Willis. There's lots of papers, literature, to support mild hypothermia with selective perfusion. 
in the early 2000s, there was a company that came out with the Cobra catheter. Anybody remember the Cobra catheter? No. Um, so what this was is a catheter that had two tracks in it. There was a track that went distal to the distal aorta. Then there was a track that went um, to the head vessels. And the blood was directed, directed up by inflating a little baffle. Once you put the cannula in, you created a baffle. And that kind of cut the aorta in half and made, um, or separated the, or the aorta in, in so that you had blood going towards the head vessels and then blood going distally. I'm not sure whatever happened to that. There's a guy in um, China, I believe, um, in 2000, and he actually wrote a paper and called it cold, cold head, warm body perfusion. His, his um, system was not simple like our system. He had three roller heads just for the arterial. And they were roller heads too. So he had one for the systemic, one for the nominate, and then he had another one when he wanted to do left carotid or left subclavian. Um, they used uh, pressure balloons, um, retrograde type. Uh, they core temp on their patients went to 32 and their head temps went to 25. And when they looked at six, six or 59 patients, these are all retrospective. He had three groups, the deep, the moderate, and the warm head, or cold head, warm body. And in all his parameters, his mortality, the OR, his mortality in the hospital, his stroke rates, his rewarming time, and his blood loss were all better in the cold head, warm body. So like I said, we use the anominate for most of our cannulation, and the core perfusion Anytime we can, we'll use a distal arch perfusion, maybe a transverse according to how much of the aortic root or, or um, transverse arch we're doing, and then occasionally we'll have to use the femoral. The circuit provides two circuits in parallel to each other. Here's your, your tr traditional circuit, that's your um, pump and arterial filter, but then we have an additional smaller circuit that just goes to the head. I'll show you pictures of this in a minute. We can individually control the temperature on both and the flow on both. So our basic circuit is probably much like your basic circuit. We um, use the Soren pumps. We use the centrifugal. Right now we're using Affinity, four to one blood, but we've moved more into Del Nido. Um, we have the Affinity arterial filter, three H inch line, arterially, half inch line venously. We have VAD set up for all cases. And then the other circuit, what we call the head circuit, is um, arterial filter, pediatric arterial filter, quarter inch tubing. We have an ectotherm in that, that system with um, flow probes and the cerebral cannula. So basically, this is a cartoon of what it looks like. One, one centrifugal pump drains blood from the reservoir, pushes into the oxygenator, and then as it comes out of the oxygenator, we split it into the two different circuits. So in most cases, our core temperature will stay around 34. Um, if we're going to have a fairly long period of circa rest for the body, we'll go colder. The um, ectotherm circuit, the head circuit, will, if it's going to be a very short, run, a very short period of perfusion, uh, we sometimes use this when we do a TE before the case and we find out there's atheroma and stuff floating around in the aorta. Um, we'll use the head circuit. Uh, to be able to cannulate the innominate. And the, the way we use the head circuit, we go on first with the innominate flow. So the surgeon feels like anything that's floating around in the aorta will now be pushed away from the head vessels. And so we sometimes use it that way. And if that's the case, our head will go to 30. Our body will stay warm. And then we also have, of course, have um, heat exchangers on the cardioplegia. So we do it now, since the poor three Ts have had their fate in life. We now will have three heater coolers sitting in the room. Not ideal. Um, the, in, the, in using this circuit, it became really quick, apparent quickly that communication is huge. Um, even once you get on, what's the flow to the head? What's the flow to the body? That will turn off the body and someone will forget the body's off. And so you, it, just communication throughout the case is really important, as well as just find out what you're going to do to begin with. So um, 
what are we going to replace? Where, what, what will that do to cannulation sites? Um, what kind of arterial pressures will we have? It's, it became key to ask that question because anesthesiologists tend not to want to put two arterial lines in. And so by asking that question up front, we got everybody going on the same page. And then um, how cold are we going to go with the two circuits? So like I say, we usually hit the nominate artery um, and then some distal arch uh, spot for cannulation. And so once we're cold and on pump, this is kind of where we're, how we're flowing. The um, nominate is flowing the head. There's clamps for, below that. The arch is, up, is clamped out. And then there's a distal cannula going distally. Sometimes that's ephemeral. Uh, venous cannulas often are two-stage, but occasionally we double cannulate. We have a right radial always so that we know what's going on in the head. And then we have a femoral artery so we know what's going on in the distal body. Lots of temperatures, bladder temperature, tympanic temperatures, and then arterial temperatures of both circuits and a venous temperature. Keep in mind that you have to worry about that Willis thing. Um, so sometimes NEARS can help you with this. Um, we haven't seen very many cases where NEARS alerted us to a problem. I can only think of one or two, and again, we don't know whether um, that was the, the real problem. We went ahead and cannulated the subclavian, um, and the NEARS really didn't change much. But I think it could probably help. We just haven't used it a lot yet. So the specifics of these, like I said, it's one centrifugal pump. We have flow probes on both circuits. Um, because we have a small cannula in one in the anominate and a larger cannula in the core, sometimes that will help with your line resistance and help dictate your flow. Uh, we have a heater, heat exchanger um, on the head circuit, which means whatever blood that the oxygenator, whatever temperature the blood is cooled to in the oxygenator, then as it goes through the head circuit, it's continually cooled as it goes through that ectotherm. We run everybody on alpha stat. Uh, ACTs are around 480. Um, the, with the with the two circuits, uh, the hematocrit our hematocrit is usually around 34 or 24. Um, we used to be higher. We're kind of coming down on that now. We're able to provide with the circuit the system. We're able to provide circuit rest for either or or both circuits. Um, temperatures or gradients are less. Um, it's usually around six because we're controlling those temperatures better. Uh, the head's a very small amount of space that you have to cool, so you're, it cools quickly if that's all that blood's doing. And since we're not cooling or the body as much, uh, we're going to lesser or warmer temperatures. We don't have to have as much gradient to get to those temperatures. So usually what we had, we we um, start with the core at 35. Unless we know right off the bat we're going to go um, to 20 degrees on the head and 28 to the, um, the body, then we'll start a little, a little cooler than that. Um, and then after, after we get the temperatures both going down, then we start adjusting the head circuit to the temp we're going to. Our total flow is around 2.2 or 2.2 to 2.4, and our cerebral flow is around 15 per kilo. Our map's usually around 60s. Um, we use isoforane, isoforane and we use NEO. So on, on initiating the circuit, normally it's a crystal A prime. And so when we initiate going on, we are flowing just to the nominate first. So we go on very slowly so that we don't give the head a shot of cold crystalloid. Um, and then once we get, let everything mix, um, then we will go ahead and once we get to full flow or goal flow on the head, we'll go ahead and open uh, the, the core. And then once we have both blood flows going well, then, we, then we'll start cooling. So flow usually takes the path of least resistance. So that's where I said, well, according to what size cannula you use, you may end up at times where you're on and you have exactly the amount of flow going to the head and to the body that you want. Um, if you don't, what we do is add a little resistance to whichever, temp whichever side we need to flow less to. Usually it's the core. 
RPMs, uh, since we have one pump, RPMs control both circuits. So if we need to restrict flow, we usually use a clamp or maybe a C-clamp um, so that we reduce the flow to the body if we need a little bit more flow going to the head. Uh, temperature adjustment, the thing about the head temperature is usually whatever you set your heater cooler to, that's what you're going to. And it usually occurs pretty quickly. So you do have to come down on your head temp slowly or else you'll overcool really quick. Uh, once we, uh, once we um, get to desired temps, we just maintain the temp at that, at that temperature. On warming, we never let the body go above 37. We never let the head circuit go above 34. Um, once you take the clamps off, the body will go ahead and warm the head the rest of the way. And what that does do is it, it would totally prevent you from ever over, overheating the head. And there's been many um, articles in the literature that as you start to warm, your head will get hotter than you think because you're still trying to warm the whole body and it ha it's a small enclosed case and so it will warm up hotter than you think it is. As I mentioned before, good communication. So anytime someone says, what are you flowing? There's never one answer, there's always two. The head flow is such and such, the body flow is such and such. The, um, as we come off pump, we'll lower both We'll lower the core flow first down to half flow. And then once we're ready to continue to come off, we'll turn off the core flow and let the head flow be the last on. And that'll be going at four or 500. And the idea that the surgeons like about this is they feel that as you come off, anything that's still around because you've just worked a lot of tissue, there's a lot of stuff that could still be in the aorta, that the flow in the head being the last to come off as the heart starts to beat and start take, taking over the job, anything that's still left in the aorta will be pushed on distal and it'll kind of um, protect the head, head vessels as we come off. Now there's the circuit again. So pretty much we've been able to produce this bloodless field. Um, we've been able to provide circulatory rest for if we need to circulatory rest either side. Um, the cannulation technique has provided cerebral and body perfusion. We've been able to protect the brain. Um, we've cooled the head, but yet cooled the body less. So we've reduced warming time. We've shortened the OR time. There's good um, literature that says if you don't go really cold, you'll probably re reduce your blood loss. And it, we also are protecting the final temperature that the brain sees as we start to rewarm after these. Any questions? <laughs>